Hello everybody, my name is Ian Lamont and this is the Amazon Deep Dive for Publishers. I'm the founder of i30 Media Corporation and I'm the author of a book called Lean Media. And today I'm going to be talking about various types of Amazon programs for publishers. And we're starting with the Ten Commandments of Amazon. In later episodes, we'll be covering the other topics that are on the left side of your screen. One important disclaimer, I don't work for Amazon. Uh, this is based on my own experience using various Amazon programs over a long period of time. It's up to you to make your own decisions about how, which programs to use and how to follow Amazon's terms. I always advise following Amazon's terms, but note that the terms may change at any time. And also some of the programs I describe here may not be available to you depending on how you have set up your relationship with Amazon. Policies uh, frequently change at Amazon. And one interesting thing is some of the policies that may apply to one program aren't quite the same for the other programs that Amazon operates. Uh, some programs may reject your application if you try to get into them, but fortunately there's usually a couple different ways to get into it. And also, just as with any sort of business relationship you have with a gigantic platform like Amazon, it's possible to lose a lot of money. So with that out of the way, let's get started on the Ten Commandments of Amazon. And I created these basically to give people a better idea of how Amazon operates and how it sees the world because this will help you see your publishing uh, business the way that Amazon sees it. So one thing that should be abundantly clear to anyone who uses Amazon uh, as, a, as a supplier or a seller, uh, Amazon puts customers above all else. And actually, if you look at its initial mission statement, they made it pretty clear that customers were, were number one. And as we will shortly see, that guides the way that they set up their strategy. And indeed, uh, Amazon's strategy is guided by what it calls a flywheel, and it's used this to grow extremely fast in a relatively short period of time. And basically, the way that it works is uh, 20, 25 years ago when Amazon got started, their idea was they wanted to attract customers with low prices and a superior customer experience. And this is when they were mostly selling books back in the 1990s. And the idea was if you did that, you'd have more customers attracted to the platform. And that in turn would attract more publishers or more sellers to the platform as well. That starts the flywheel going because cash flow is coming in, business is taking place, and Amazon is kind of speeding up. And what they're doing is they're investing their profits and the revenue into services that support the flywheel. So in the left corner there, you might see these buildings. Those are basically Amazon's warehouses and fulfillment centers. And then on the lower right, you'll see this uh, data database symbol. Um, and basically that represents the web services that Amazon were using to support the website. So as those improved, those allowed Amazon to lower its prices further, which attracted more customers, attracted still more sellers, and allowed the flywheel to go even faster. And then, you know, over many years, these flywheels, these separate little flywheels like fulfillment centers and uh, Amazon data services, they grew into their own flywheels and started spinning off their own businesses. So uh, this kind of basic strategy is the way Amazon has operated for uh, more than 20 years now. So one important thing to keep in mind is that even though Amazon started out as a bookseller, books are only a small part of its business right now. And this uh, internet meme went around a couple years ago showing Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon in 1998, when he was kind of like, you know, a nerdy bookseller, just like we are right now. And then in 2017, and nearly 20 years later, and he looks like the Terminator. And the internet meme said, you know, on the left, oh, I sell books. And then on the right, it's like, I sell whatever I want. And it's true. Right now, Amazon has a bunch of different businesses that are far, far larger than its book selling business. And just to give you an example, uh, in a recent year, Amazon's AWS, which stands for Amazon Web Services, was 20, revenue was $25.6 billion. That's uh, in the year 2018. And it grew from like five billion five years previously. So this is double digit growth, mid, mid uh, you know, 40% or 50% growth uh, over a very short period of time. And AWS is now a giant. And it's basically what they're doing is they're selling their uh, web services and cloud services and other types of technical services to clients from small players, including publishers up to these uh, other giant corporations which need to use them. So it's a big business for them. 3PS stands for third party sellers. That's also a huge business for Amazon. And that's a recent uh, data point from Amazon public, public figures. By comparison, uh, publishers themselves, 
you know, in the United States, the publishing business, I think, generated about $26 billion in 2017. So even assuming that Amazon has half of that business, so $13 billion, it's not nearly as big as AWS or its uh, third party sellers who are selling various things on Amazon. So just keep that in mind uh, as you're as you're regarding Amazon, because while in 1998 it was really focused on books, that's no longer the case. So Amazon likes brands, and I put brands in in a, in quotation marks there because its view of brands is different than what we think of as brands. So I say it likes them, but it, or at least respects them, and then certainly gives them uh, benefits that. Uh, other other types of companies that aren't that don't have brands uh, simply don't have its definition is narrow and specifically to, to Amazon you are only a brand if you have a trademark in the U.S. Uh, PTO principal registry and there, in the in, in the United States there's a couple different types of trademarks uh, including trademarks in the secondary registry those don't count to Amazon it has to be a registered trademark in the principal registry. And when you have that and you register it at Amazon Brand Services, all of a sudden you unlock these special powers on Amazon uh, as a publisher or as a seller that can really help your business. And I'll get more into that later on. And uh, these special opportunities um, are not only available to, to publishers, they're available to sellers of, of all kinds. And they can really uh, help protect your business on Amazon and they can really help promote your business on Amazon. So that's important to keep in mind. So Amazon has all kinds of data. They really leverage it to the max. And they're gathering things that I think most publishers wouldn't even think are worth gathering. But then not only do they gather them, they kind of milk that data for everything that it's worth. Uh, it's important to know that they know exactly what's selling on Amazon, including amongst your own products. They may not know your, your margin or your, or your own costs, but they certainly know which ones are popular and which ones aren't. And that will affect things like where your books or other products you're selling show up in Amazon search and on uh, Amazon carousels and on other places. Um, sometimes they may make changes, like they'll tweak the algorithm that guides search and it won't be in your favor, but at other times it, it may help you out. Um, and they're also using this data to, to launch uh, new types of services that publishers have access to. Here's one example. Um, I sell things on Amazon that are related to my publishing business and they'll do things. This is a, a dashboard shot from uh, one of the tools that I use on Amazon. It, it shows not only how many units of each uh, SKU are selling in 7, 30, 60, and 90 days. It also shows how many cubic feet uh, these items take take up in their warehouses. And they're using that, that data to calculate uh, how much I should pay in extra storage fees and, and all kinds of things. So this is just a small sample of the type of data that Amazon gathers. And, you know, as far as I know, a lot of the other players in the publishing ecosystem, even the ones that do wholesaling or have other types of uh, services online, they don't gather this type of data or it's not as fine toothed as the data that Amazon gathers. So Amazon's a siloed organization. And when I say that, it means that uh, when there's one group at Amazon, they may not be communicating with other groups at Amazon, uh, even though they may need to, to collaborate to help you solve some sort of problem. And when you talk with them, they'll say something like this, oh, you'll need to contact this other group to get an answer to that or to fix that particular issue. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's actually the way a lot of corporations work these days, including uh, Apple, for instance. So I don't think you should be very surprised about that. Amazon will swear up and down that its programs are great and they'll launch these programs aimed at publishers and sellers that it says are supposedly really, really super. This screenshot you see right here is a program that um, is available to me. It's called Seller Fulfilled Prime. And if you know what Pr Amazon Prime is, that's the service you subscribe to every year. And basically once you subscribe to it, you're supposed to get your stuff from Amazon in like two days. This, this program is aimed at sellers and they want sell, Amazon wants sellers to take over the responsibility of delivering things to customers in two days. And they're making it seem like it's a great thing, but actually for, for uh, smaller sellers in particular, this is a nightmare because basically you have to be staffed up like 24 seven and able to ship something out and have you know UPS trucks stopping at your house every day to pick things up by a certain period of time. So you're running yourself ragged uh, for the sake of delivering something in two days. And by the way, Amazon doesn't want you to increase prices that much to accommodate that. So this is a program where 
when this started, first started popping up on my screen, I just ignored it. And there's no way I'm going to do that because, <laughs> frankly, it's going to make my life hell. Um, that's one example. It, also in the publishing space, you know, a program like Audible, this is for audiobooks, distributing audiobooks. You know, on the face of it, it seems great because you have access to all of Amazon's customers. But the problem is, you know, you're not getting paid that much. A 13-hour book, according to some rates that were published last year, would generate 75 cents in income and uh, revenue for the publisher. And that doesn't, that doesn't even include the, the cut that the narrator gets. So this is really, um, you know, I don't want to say nickel and diming, but you're not getting much money from that from that particular service. And then things like KDP Select, uh, I think a lot of people know in the uh, publishing world know know what that program is. It makes these Kindle books available to uh, Kindle Unlimited users. The problem is, is you're kind of locking yourself into only one platform because you're not supposed to be selling elsewhere. It, like you can't sell your you can't sell those books on Apple or Google Play if those if they're enrolled in Amazon KDP Select. You get some some marketing programs in in return, uh, but I don't think the payout rate or the uh, or the program lock-in is worth it. So anyways, m my point about this is uh, just be careful when you're you, when you have a chance to use a certain Amazon program because it may not be worth it for for you and it's up to you to evaluate whether or not they're worth it. Number 8 uh, Amazon deals with lots of scams, and I think if you pay close attention to the Amazon publishing world, you you probably hear about them. Uh, the KDP Kindle Direct Publishing universe is filled with them, and basically, why it happens is a lot of Amazon programs, not just KDP but other ones too. There's very low barriers to entry, meaning it's easy to get set up and start selling stuff. And this this makes it easy for not only legitimate businesses to get started on Amazon, it also makes it easier for scammers to get started. Um, they don't test the programs enough or they don't test them in ways that the scammers are going to test them. And basically the scammers, when they come on, they're going to look for every single loophole that they can find, uh, every single exploit that they can make, either you know technical or uh, through some loophole in the policies. And they don't care, the scammers don't care if you, a legitimate business person, loses money on them. And the scams include everything from tricks with um, Kindle, Kindle books to increase the payout in Amazon KDP Select, uh, sellers selling either pirated stuff or low quality stuff, people buying fake reviews to make something look like it's a five star product when it really isn't. Um, some programs that exist outside of the Amazon universe, that is Amazon's not operating them, other people are operating them, but they, they basically take advantage of loopholes and uh, not only do they, you know, are they scams or, you know, committing fraud, sometimes they can get sellers into uh, into big trouble and the sellers may be in, you know unaware of what's going really going on and then also i hate to say it there's a lot of people peddling advice out there and they're either not that familiar with the programs or they're they're overcharging money for uh, for services of and insights that i think are of relatively limited value um, as a result amazon has set up these automated systems to catch the bad guys but unfortunately you know they're just kind of uh, you know, punishing first and 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 checking checking to make sure that this, it's actually a legitimate a legitimate uh, bad guy later on. Um, sometimes sometimes what happens are legitimate companies may get flagged and they've literally done nothing wrong, or they may have inadvertently done something wrong. They weren't a, they weren't aware of it because after all, the terms of services are changing so frequently, and they're they're getting bagged along with the you know the really bad guys out there. And then uh, CSR, that means customer service representative. They may treat you with suspicion, even if you've done absolutely nothing wrong. So these are some of the issues that uh, that you have to deal, that you have to think about when you're dealing with Amazon. And this is the way that Amazon views uh, potentially a lot of sellers and publishers. Uh, you know, most of us are good, but some of the, some of us are bad. And Amazon, as a result, kind of casts a wary eye upon us. Um, Amazon has lots of TOSs. TOS means terms of service. And these are the terms that you have to follow if you participate in these programs. It's interesting because uh, I, I use a lot of Amazon programs and it's interesting to see how some of them are different. And to give you an example, um, if you use Amazon KDP, you're not supposed to use competitors, competing books or authors names in, in your metadata that you submit to Amazon. So for instance, if you're, uh, you write horror books, and you, you can't put Stephen King or Carrie in the metadata fields that, that um, Amazon makes available to you. 
Uh, however, if you're using Amazon advertising, this is a self-serve ad platform, you can use competitors' uh, metadata in the, in the keywords fields that you're submitting to Amazon. So you just have to be aware that there are some big differences there. And just because it's okay to do something in one program doesn't mean that it's automatically okay in another one. Try to follow the rules, um, especially the obvious stuff. This might mean going through the terms of service, uh, and of course, a lot of it's legal boilerplate. But some of the some of the some of the uh, terms in the terms of service documentation, it's really easy to understand exactly what they're talking about. Um, the community Amazon's community guidelines are another uh, area which it's it's really clear what exactly what they don't want you to do. They don't want you to buy reviews. They don't want you to uh, give give something to somebody else in exchange for a review or in the case of books, if you do it, you're, that, that person is supposed to disclose that they got a, a, a free copy uh, in return for giving their honest review. Um, let's say that you make a mistake and you know you've made a mistake, maybe it's inadvertent, but then you discover it later on, or maybe you thought that Amazon wouldn't catch you. You just got to own it. And you have to, you have to really tell them what you're going to do to address this particular problem. Like this is never going to happen again because X, Y, or Z. Don't blame other people like a supplier for a problem. Um, basically, this is something where you have to work with your supplier to make sure that this will never, ever happen again. Or if it's a supplier, and that could include like a marketing company, and they've done something really evil, you've just got to cut, you know, you've got to, you've got to cut your relationship with them. Um, so, so don't try to pass blame. Um, one interesting thing is, is when Amazon makes a mistake, they, they don't always own it and uh, they don't really give any benefit to you other than kind of like a grudging apology that, oh, sorry about that. Sorry for shutting down your account. Well, we made a mistake with that. Um, try to keep pushing for a resolution and escalate things reasonably. Um, and if, if worse comes to worse, you can actually email Jeff Bezos. Somebody on his executive team will hopefully look at it and hopefully maybe try to resolve things in a way if you get stuck in some sort of customer service um, you know, loop or you can't get past a particular problem. Uh, and, but treat them as human beings. They're, they're, they're just trying to follow the rules that they have to, that they have to go by. And uh, you know, they're not monsters. Oftentimes they're working in other countries, um, but just try to, try to be patient with them and recognize and try to you know, hopefully come to a resolution that both sides are happy. All right, so Jeff Bezos famously said that your margin is my opportunity. This was, um, I think this was something he said about maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And I'm going to illustrate this with what's called a value chain. That's this, this diagram here in the, on the left side. And the idea is, you know, if there's a relationship between a manufacturer and its customers, you know, there's, there's several different parts to this value chain. Each part gets some return from it, some value from it, whether it's money or increasing their marketplace power. In the case of a customer, they're getting a product or service that they need. That's a typical one. Amazon's is different. Basically, they, the way that they see value chains, in my humble opinion, is they want to get rid of all the intermediaries. So they're the only one left. They want to take from your part of the value chain to increase their own power, and they also they want to give something to the customer as well. It's totally lopsided, but that's the way that they see the that's what the way that they see the world, in my opinion. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that Amazon, you know, they're finding lots of ways to take value from you. They'll take a cut of all sales. You should know that. Um, if there's some sort of problem with a particular order, they want you to to take responsibility, even if you didn't do anything wrong. Or even if you're suspicious that the customer is trying to trying to pull a fast one, you, they want you. Amazon wants you to pay for it. Um, if there's a, a new feature, oftentimes they want you to pay for it too. And these are these are things that are as simple as like um, you know products that are sitting sitting in the warehouse for too long to something like Amazon Transparency, which is an anti piracy program. You, you know, you'd figure that Amazon would be would be covering the cost of that to cut down on piracy. No, they want you to pay for pay for that. So. That's kind of an interesting uh, way of seeing of seeing problems, but they, the way that they see it is they see it's another opportunity to kind of extract value from you. And you may be thinking after hearing my Ten Commandments out, like, "Geez, this is pretty depressing." You know, what's my opportunity? And actually, I think there are big opportunities uh, for people that are in the Amazon ecosystem. So there's a lot of really powerful programs. I'm going to be talking about them in this series, and then. 
also the learning experiences you have on Amazon, they can be transferred to other parts of your business that are outside of the Amazon ecosystem. To, just to give you a small example, I've developed some products. These are book-like products with ISBNs that I'm now selling direct to customers outside of the Amazon ecosystem, but I used Amazon to develop them. And in fact, this, it's a great way to test stuff and to build new brands and then bring them outside. And you see this happening a lot nowadays where brands, they launch on Amazon and then they expand to retail, they expand to direct sales, etc. Um, you have to really be aware of your costs though to make, to make your Amazon business work. And I'm not just talking about the editorial royalty, marketing, um, production costs that most publishers already deal with and they're very familiar with. I'm talking about the other Amazon costs that Amazon tax on as, as the price of doing business on their gigantic platform. And they include everything from little fees, shipping, thing, shipping things to, to uh, Amazon seller or Amazon Advantage warehouses. You have to pay for that. They may give you a discount, but you're st it's still coming out of your pocket. Um, if you're using Amazon FBA, for instance, you have to pay for what's called a pro seller account. That's currently $40 per month. All kinds of things pop up, fees pop up, and uh, promotions using Amazon promotional programs. You know, they cost money too. They're, Amazon's not just giving you free coupons to use to sell your stuff on Amazon. They want you to pay <laughs> for the coupons every time someone uses it. So you have to be aware of that and factor that in because all of a sudden the margin you once thought was was uh, super safe and super good. Now it's been, you know, cut down, you know, death by a thousand cuts. And maybe you're not even making a profit on the item. That's ha That happens to people. So you have to be careful of that. Uh, there's some more examples of fees that uh, come up nowadays when you're using Amazon services. So on the other, and the other thing to keep in mind is that Amazon makes available. I mentioned before, Amazon has all kinds of data. They keep a lot of it pretty close to the vest, like exactly how much uh, item is, how many items a competitor's product is selling, or some other data about like, like for instance, how people are getting to the particular product page for your products. Uh, but there are other types of data that you can use to help your business. They include uh, your own reviews, that is, uh, users who buy your books or other products, what they say about it, as well as uh, reviews of competitors' books or competitors' products, sales trends. Amazon advertising gives some fantastic advertising data that you can use. So these are all important things. Here's a small example of a data point that I don't think is really made available to any other uh, platform. So, you know, I sell ebooks on Apple and Google and Kobo and places like that. It's very, very basic sales data. That's all I get from them. Amazon, this is an interesting product. This is available on Amazon Author Central. It basically shows the uh, sales by region across the United States. And, you know, for, for the products that I sell, I, looking at this chart, I can see actually a big chunk of my business is in places like East Coast and West Coast of the United States, whereas big, big cities in the middle of the country, Chicago and Houston and Dallas and places like that, you know, it's okay, but it's not as great. So this, if I wanted to take this data and do something with it, I could say, hmm, well, I'm selling pretty well on the East Coast and the West Coast. Maybe my opportunity is in the middle of the country where sales are relatively low. So I could, you know, adjust my marketing. Maybe marketing not on Amazon, but actually marketing on a, on a platform like Facebook or regional advertising or co-op shows or whatever. Or I could look at this data and say, well, it looks like my true customers are on the East Coast and West Coast. So that's where I should be really continuing to continue my efforts. So you see there's different ways of looking at this data, but the, the point I want to make is this data is available to you on Amazon and it's kind of included as a part of doing business on Amazon. They're not charging uh, for this particular data point. It's like something that they make available to you. And I really recommend that you uh, take advantage of those free data points. And then, you know, a, this is a classic approach to business. You scale stuff that works. When I say scale, that means you grow it. So if you're able to sell 10 10 units uh, in your book series and it sells really well because of whatever reason, all right, not, next step is try to sell 100 of them if it's easy to do. Um, and that could be for anything that you're doing. Ancillary products, marketing programs that are working. Like if you find that a, a uh, you know an advertisement you place either on Amazon or somewhere else is working, do it again, sign up again, continue the campaign, just make it go. Try, try to get as much value out of that as you can. If you find suppliers that work with you, Absolutely. Yeah. Those are the folks that you should, you know, you should try to increase that relationship or the next time you have something to make, go back to them. 
And similarly, if you're finding a cost-cutting measure is working, well, try to apply that to other parts of your business. And conversely, if stuff isn't working out, whether it's a book series or a marketing campaign or a supplier, just, uh, you know, you can certainly try to iterate and maybe improve it or tweak things to see if you can make it work. But if it's really not working and you've, done, and you've spent a lot of time and money on it already, I think that's at that point you should really try to, uh, to, to cut your efforts there. So I talked earlier about the Amazon flywheel model, and that's, what, that's what's on the left there. I think a good way to think about your own business, publishing business and seller business, is whether you can develop your own flywheel. So you as a publisher, you're kind of attached to Amazon's flywheel. And you, know, you see those arrows going back and forth between Amazon and the publisher. Don't just think of that as like you're sending them product and they're sending you money. Think of those arrows as also representing things like learning experiences or testing ideas or data going back and forth. And that's helping to move your own flywheel around. And all of a sudden, you're able to start developing new ideas and new products. You're able to get new customers separate from Amazon's customers who may be coming to your website or looking for your brand in other places. And then also, you know, sales are taking place outside of the Amazon ecosystem. But it's, you're, you're actually getting value from the Amazon ecosystem that allows you to do that. So that's the way that I kind of see, uh, you know, the flywheel opportunity for publishers. And finally, you know, for a long time, I was hoping that some sort of white knight would come and, uh, you know, save me from Amazon. Because like a lot of publishers, a lot of my business is, is occupied by Amazon. And I'd like to be more, I'd like it to be more diversified. And this chart shows kind of the the scale of the problem. Sorry if the numbers are a little bit small, but the blue segment there, that represents Amazon's share of the US retail e-commerce market in 2018. So basically they have about half and it's growing. The um, orange segment, that's all the tiny little retailers and small scale e-commerce players in the universe. And that includes maybe your own website. And then you have a few kind of small to medium sized players like eBay, um, Apple and Walmart, but they're just, they're less, all of those are less than 10%. So Amazon is really where it's at. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the other potential contenders, they're just not set up to, to grow that fast. And they have their own problems that really prevent them this from happening. So that it could include something like cultural problems, like barnesandnoble.com. They've been around for more than 20 years too, but sometimes you know, I think that some parts of their business really want to move fast and try out new things, but some parts of their business are really, you know, really traditionally focused and they don't like working with independent sellers, for instance. I've discovered that the hard way after trying many times to break into that. Uh, some companies, they have other priorities and that would be like Apple and Google. You know, Google's priority is not Google Play for books. Its, its priorities are more along the lines of the Android platform some of these new businesses that they're getting into, and of course, uh, search, search advertising. And then you have companies that just can't move that fast just because of the way that they're set up um, or they have other stuff going on. And again, Apple falls into that particular category. At one time, Apple, I think, I think they used to have a superior, superior e-reader experience on the iPad. But you know, since then, Amazon has really moved so fast with developing the Kindle platform. And I think they've just, uh, Amazon has really taken over that particular spot. A lot of these companies, they don't want to deal with indies. Walmart is a classic example there. They don't want to talk to you unless you're making a certain amount of money. And then you have, sadly, you have some players in the publishing ecosystem that are just, you know, outright incompetent or uh, very, very greedy as well. And that includes Bowker. That's the U.S. ISBN monopoly. And, um, you know, they, they had some terrible... Uh, website experiences for their users were basically the website was hacked and users credit card information and other data was getting stolen uh, you know right under their noses for six months and they were so even though they even though they made money hand over fist uh, charging way too much money to small publishers for ISBN packages and uh, things that they don't need such as like a, a, a barcode file you know they charge money for that you can get it somewhere for free uh, while they were making all this money, they were letting their website just basically languish. And actually, the website today, even today, it's still the same website that I was using uh, seven years ago. It hasn't changed at all. They haven't reinvested that money. They're just extracting money off of the off of the off of our backs. Uh, you know, I will say that there are some publishers, uh, people in the publishing ecosystem that are innovative and that are doing things that Amazon can't do that well, and I think are great to work with. They include companies like Ingram 
and um, uh, Kobo and also Wattpad. Uh, and usually they, those companies, they have some either some existing strength that Amazon can't break into that easily, or they're doing something that Amazon is not able to do, like Wattpad, which is a service for um, basically for young readers to, to read serial content or works in progress on their phone. Uh, but so Amazon hasn't gotten into that yet. And so, you know, you can seek those services out. But unfortunately, I, I don't see how those services can grow big enough to, to really become a huge competitor to Amazon. Um, so they're just oper they're operating in kind of niche areas. So that's all for this particular segment. I'm going to release other segments as well on the Amazon Deep Dive for Publishers. For more information, go to leanmedia.org. You can also follow me on those social media accounts listed right there. Thank you very much for watching.